So this presentation, as you've seen in the name, is Benefits of Smart Wallets. I'm Pedro from Wallet Connect, and Wallet Connect is an open source standard for communicating wallets to dApps. And it's specifically targeted at wallets that exist right now, but as I'm viewing the future, I think we're going to see more smart wallets coming. So I wanted to start the conversation about what are smart wallets? How many of you are even aware of this word or what it would imply of a non-smart wallet or a smart wallet definition? Can you raise your hand if you know what a smart wallet is? OK, that's great. We have a lot of room to play here then. <laughs> so. Wallets as exist right now, they're a public and private key pair. And this is the key difference of what it implies to be a smart wallet or a, a non-smart wallet. So looking at the differences of a wallet and smart wallet, it has to do all about private key management. With private key management defining that you have a device or you have an app that holds your keys, and that's what constitutes a wallet. But that there's not a lot of room for us to build a good user experience with that pattern because we're restricted by the cryptographic rules where the public key serves as the public key that you share with others and the private key is the one you sign it to verify that you are who you are. But then we come to this problem that there's only one copy of the private public and private key pair. So this is the problem where we have the seed phrase problem of you have to write down your 12 to 16 or 18 or 24 words in order to recover your key that generates this pair. With the smart wallet, we are able to have X public private key pairs. And now you're thinking, isn't this what uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets or HD wallets are that generate multiple keys? No, this is basically how wallets exist right now. When you have a seed phrase, you're generating multiple keys. That's how it works, and we end up just using the first key it generates as your main account. But if you go to MetaMask, you can just add as many accounts as possible. So that's what the seed phrase is doing. In this scenario, we have X amount of keys which actually control one wallet. So how can we break or change the rules of cryptography with smart wallets in the case for wallets? This comes with the part where we're building on Ethereum specifically or in a smart contract based wallet. So let's think that this is not Ethereum specific, but I'm going to talk mostly about Ethereum because this is one of the movements that's happening right now with a user experience where instead of having the public and private key representing your wallet, you actually have a smart contract. So this is the significant difference about the wallet or a smart wallet, where this is a normal account. Sorry, I need to write this up. So you have the private key pair, which is a normal account represented on the blockchain, and now your wallet is actually a contract. So this is actually very similar to multi-sig wallets, and it actually is. This is a multi-sig wallet. But we were expanding more than just the multi-sig wallets that exist on Bitcoin and has already existed for years. And we are actually providing more features. We are providing recovery options. We're providing maybe access control. So we're being smarter about how we actually play with the usage of all of these keys and how we can actually provide different permission levels to these keys. And that's exactly what I see going from Right now, we have wallets, which are just one public and private key pair, which are act as normal accounts. And then we have smart contract wallets or smart contract based wallets or smart wallets, which actually act as one contract, which has multiple keys actually accessing this wallet. So how do you guys think this would play from a user perspective? Can someone suggest how this would look like for a user? Like a login, regular login. Yeah, it could be like a login, but how does it differ from a normal account in terms of a login? Well, what, what actually plays a difference from a user? Probably have to submit transactions from most of the things you 
Right. So this is this is where it gets complicated because usually when you have a transaction, you would need this transaction to be signed by the key that you're actually submitting. If you have multiple keys, how do these keys actually pay for the transaction to be submitted to this contract? This is where we actually get to the problem of these keys now have to have some ether to actually transact in order to submit on the behalf of this contract. And this is where uh, some ERC standards uh, start coming into play, where we start standardizing some of these patterns. This first pattern of having a contract acting as a multi-sig that you have multiple keys is the ERC 725, or also called the identity proxy contracts um, standard. But then other standards have come into play, for example, ERC 1077, which stands for executable signed messages, which is a very boring and technical name. We call it meta transactions. It's pretty cool. So meta transactions can actually allow all of these keys to actually sign messages so they don't actually have to pay for the ether. And then this, these messages are sent to relayers, which will submit these transactions and get a reward. So these messages are basically just containing a transaction, which you're signing to move some funds or to interact with other smart contracts, which another relayer will submit them on chain for a reward that is attached to those tran meta transactions. The, these meta transactions are then sent to the smart contract which acts as your wallet, and then your smart contract wallet will then interact with the other wallets. So at the end, when you're writing a smart contract, your smart contract always sees your smart contract wallet. It doesn't even see the these relayer mechanics because at the end, these, these transactions are delegate calls from this smart contract wallet. How do you guys see this playing with DeFi applications? How, how would applications change in terms of smart wallets? Will this be a change that will require a lot of implementation? Will this be different for developers? Yes, raise your hand. Well, I have a question for you. If, if this uh, multi-sig contract is doing the signing, does that mean everything that's signed has to be on chain? So, the signing is being made by the multiple private keys which have access to the smart contract, right? But we didn't actually pay ether with these accounts. So you just sign the message and the relayer then submit it on chain. I think I have a similar question. So are the signatures collected off chain or are they? Yes, exactly. So the, they're messages. So the big difference between a message and a transaction, it's exactly that. It, a message is off-chain and a transaction is on-chain. That's why a transaction has to be signed and has to pay Ether, and a message doesn't. But in this case, you're still paying Ether off-chain by this, let's say, protocol or on top of the blockchain, which is the relayers actually submitting the transaction on your behalf. We're taking the decentralization a step backwards to provide a better user experience. Because once you have multiple private key pairs, you actually allow uh, recovery systems to play with this one, there's not much room for it. You either have your seed phrase or you don't. Here, because you have multiple private key pairs, you can have different keys that you hold in different devices, or you have different keys with different permission levels. Some can actually revoke other keys. Some can actually add or can actually access specific dApps. So this is where I wanted to get about how this all plays in the sense of like, DeFi applications and new patterns that we actually can have is the permissions that we give all of these public private keys is that from a DAP, you're still seeing this smart contract because in the blockchain, you don't actually see a smart contract as differently as normal accounts. At the end, they're just holding some assets and you actually just see an address. It doesn't actually differentiate. So from a user standpoint, they still have their public address. Their public address just happens to be a smart contract instead of the actual key that's living on their device. Yes? So like to create uh, an account as a transaction rather than a message as well, then, and to authorize more keys as a transaction, is that correct? That's correct. A meta transaction, though. Because at the end, the, it will be on chain, but you won't be the submitter of this transaction. So, go ahead. 
Uh, it will, so each smart wallet has, a, has its own, uh, sorry, a new smart contract needs to be deployed for each smart wallet, is that the case? Correct. Who's responsible for deploying? So when you create a new wallet, you would be creating a new public and private key pair, which is the generator on device. In this scenario, you're actually just creating a smart contract that is being deployed right away. Then every other device, being a desktop, being a mobile wallet, you're generating keys, which you don't even technically look at them. You're not even aware of them. They're just other points of access to the same smart contract. So you only deploy it once. So there's no need to have multiple wallets. So the relayer deploys the contract for you. So you, like, you sign the message in your wallet, talk to the relayer. They make a new contract for you, and that's when you start managing the keys? Possibly. So that's one of the implementations that you can actually have. Uh, depending on the wallet provider, you could have multiple implementations of how this deployment actually goes into place. We can think of these contract deployments as ha being a cost of user acquisition for the wallet providers, or we can have the users. Uh, to be honest, there's a lot of applications in traditional finance who has done this, where you have to at least put, I don't know, $50 into your account to actually get started. So you can actually put $50 into your account, and then it collateralizes for the contract deployment. So you, there's no loss on the wallet provider side. But also, we can think of startups where we spend about 10 to $20 in user acquisition, and that just kind of does it for it. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Hi. Um, so relayers, uh, the job of relayers is to like get me whenever there's a message that's signed by like the people who hold the private keys, right? Uh, their job is to put it uh, on chain, right? Or uh, to, to for the to interact with the smart contract. So what incentivizes th this behavior? Because they still they are the ones paying for, it. they are using their own ETH to pay for the transaction, right? So I'm glad you asked that question because it, it brings me to the next pattern of how smart wallets are smarter than normal accounts, which is meta transactions include this, um, the, how do I say it? Uh, so you have the transaction itself that you're signing that you actually want to go on chain, and then you have the other parts of the transaction which actually tell you that there's a, a reward, I'm going to call it the reward. So the meta transaction has a reward, which is at least the amount of the transaction fee or uh, higher than the transaction fee. So the incentive is that you have the cost of the transaction fee being paid, so there's no cost to the relayer, plus the reward. So from a user standpoint, you're paying more, or maybe the wallet provider is covering these rewards on your behalf. So these rewards will have that you can actually look at the list of meta transactions that are available and you want to get the rewards and you cover them and you cover the transaction fees and you get the rest of the reward. So this smart contract, when it, when it actually calls these meta transactions, not only is calling the, the, the smart contract which you are interacting with, but is also sending some, some value to the submitter. So there's multiple events happening at the point where meta transactions are actually submitted to the blockchain. And one of them is actually paying the submitter whatever money or token. So this is where I wanted to get where meta transaction actually allows us to pay with tokens. So no longer we have to have users that imagine you have this wallet which has the wallet token. And you want to give users a thousand wallet tokens, but then you also have to give a a little tiny ether so they can pay the transaction fees. With meta transactions, you can actually have them only use wallet tokens completely, and then they submit meta transactions, which the submitters will receive wallet tokens to pay for those transactions, and you, they get the reward from just debiting your account. Sorry. So isn't this where sort of zero X and stuff like that would kick in in case the relayer doesn't want your wallet token, but you know, with whitelist some other token? That's a really good question. So these are the kind of things that I wanted to spark the discussions. How do DeFi applications will change or adapt to the, these new smart wallets? There's a whole economy kind of running that it 
also benefits the users for having like this user experience with key recovery and multiple uh, key management that wasn't possible before. But there's also this relay and network economy that I would like to see everyone kind of discuss of how do we create these incentivization or how do we create these exchanges for paying for these transaction fees? Because maybe there's not enough liquidity for wallet tokens. Maybe, maybe people want 0x tokens or maybe they want status tokens and people are now paying in wallet tokens and now maybe the wallet provider needs to actually exchange them before actually submitting to the relayer network. So how do you see these actually playing out in terms of DeFi applications? Will we have exchanges for relayers? Will we have uh, the wallets actually exchanging on the behalf of users? There's a lot we can actually do. And one of the things we haven't even talked to is about how the public-private key can actually have multiple permissions. It's not just about having permissions about adding other keys to your wallet. It's also about having permissions specific to a dApp. So we can have dApps that move funds with higher value and lower value. And the user can actually have this assurance that when you actually interact with a dApp, you actually interact with one key that has an, a lower permission. And it can actually only move 10 to $20. So this would be great for games, for example, where you actually get, have the assurance of playing a game and you can still have your wallet having $10,000 and your, your game developer is not going to take $10,000 with you because the key you actually use for that game I can actually move only $10 a day or something. So it will take probably a thousand days for the game developer to steal that. So. How do you guys see DeFi applications? For example, ZeroX, that was a really good example of how ZeroX will play a part in actually providing liquidity for this relay network. But what about loans? What, what, would, what would loans look like for smart wallets? Are you thinking about loans for the relayers or for the end users? It could be. It could be. So we could have loans in terms of paying these fees or maybe loans for the wallet providers. There's there's a few players here. We can we can have loans for relayers. Relayers want to get started, but they need a certain liquidity because in order for them to actually submit these meta transactions, they need the liquidity to pay for all of this ether because they want to acquire some tokens through these meta transaction rewards. So we can actually have loan systems that actually incentivize relayers to um, collateralize some tokens or get more ETH in order to pay for more transactions and have like these business models for relayers. So that's a, one of the examples. But I want to see kind of like derivatives or other uh, financial tools that we can actually impact the smart wallets. Is there any other questions in terms of smart wallets? I, I really want to make sure you guys got... How does it go for privacy? Because if you have that smart wallet, it's, it's great. It's a very seamless user experience. You don't need to calculate the key gas. But you can do that. I mean, you look at this for our app, but the issue is that you can link the wallets to each other, at least the transactions over time. When you say link to each other, you're saying the contract or the, the public-private key pairs? Just the, the, the various wallets, how they interact with each other. Gotcha. So I agree. There's a, there's some privacy issues here, and that's one of the things that uh, I'm still skeptical to the scalability of ERC-725. I think there's a lot of room for improvement, and we're going to see a lot of changes to how we actually use identity. But I also think that these contract deployments are not that expensive. They wouldn't, they, it wouldn't stop us to just create new wallets, because even though you have like this smart contract that you can use everywhere with multiple private keys, there's nothing stopping you with just creating a new account. We do that with Twitter. We do that with social platforms. There's nothing that's going to stop us from creating maybe a smart wallet that you use for your uh, savings, another one for dailies, another one for playing games. So, so I, I was just imagining instead of more of the ICO where you're investing directly for the tokens, you could create a fund where you're investing to have relayers running to make the plat to facilitate the platform. So then in return those relayers are getting the tokens from it, but that doesn't actually happen until people start using it. And so you don't get that return on the value until the platform's actually being used. Um, 
Okay, that's interesting. I, will, I would like to hear more on that. Like, uh, can you expand on that? So, I, I think like cloud mining is, is something that, you know, like people don't want to invest um, in buying hardware, so they pay for the service to do the mining. So it's like the same thing, but you're, instead of mining a currency, you're providing the relay service to make the new token work in the system and make your DAP work properly. That's a really good, a really good idea. I actually thought about how relayers actually create an incentivization for full nodes that we never had an incentive to run a full node. But once you actually have a relay network, you're actually getting paid to run a full node, which is almost like a second layer mining, like you were describing. That's a really good question. Any others? Do you see the relayer as ending up charging something like a subscription fee and just to basically offer service money? Yes, I do. I do see that because I, I always like to compare this smart wallet economy to the music where we used to pay for albums and then we paid for songs and then eventually we got tired and we paid $10 for Spotify and Apple Music. So even with the wallet providers, it's not sustainable for them to cover for the meta transactions and eventually the users don't want to pay for every transaction they make. So we're going to end up with this subscription module, which could be relayer dependent, wallet dependent, DAP dependent. So I'm very curious to see where who is going to be handling the economy of these meta transactions because now we've moved this dependency that we had from miners to actually uh, distribute this wealth or this liquidity to other par parties like dApps dApps could pay for it dApps could profit from it so even dApps have the incentive of submitting your meta transactions we always say that uh, Relayers are third parties, but at the end, if you're a DAP, you have the incentive to submit the transaction of your user as soon as possible because you, you want to get moving. So maybe you have the incentive to pay for those managed transactions. Or maybe you have the incentive of having a lower fee on those managed transactions. So. Covering on subscriptions, uh, are there any group projects that I'm not aware of that are tackling that problem? Yeah. That anyone else have? So, Meta, uh, subscriptions are heavily dependent on meta transactions. So it's a sub a superset of meta transactions where you have recurring meta transactions. Um, there's the ERC-1337, which is the one you're mentioning. Uh, projects that are working on, there's a, f a few. There's 8x protocol, there's Groundhog, and there's a lot of people working directly on open source on making 1337 available. Uh, maybe can you talk a little bit about the like meta transactions and account abstraction? Um, and like, was it like the sender pays? Um, what the status is on <coughs> on implementing this for for um, like so smart wallets? Technically, this is account abstraction. Can you? So is, but then sender or like the sender pays like the idea that you can have DApps pay for. Or a smart contract pay for yes. transaction. Yeah, yeah. So when I meant the submitter, it's the sender. I just gave it a different name because we're used to the sender being. I, excuse me, I meant recipient. Please. <laughs> so the recipient. I assume uh, assume uh, MakerDAO wants to um, pay wants to pay for anyone that puts ETH into a CDP. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like I said, who is going to be uh, more incentivized to actually have these meta transactions submitted on the blockchain. Depending on each use case, we can have the wallet providers covering the transaction as a user acquisition, or we can have the DAP actually incentivizing free transactions on our DAP by having meta transactions paid for them, or we can have relayers actually have these subscription models where they are running their own full nodes and actually collecting as many meta transactions to submit it as. as is there a way for a for a relayer to know that they will get paid for a transaction by the by the recipient the recipient of the transaction, or is that like is there a standard for for um, for reimbursing a relayer by the DAP instead of the the sender? As the development right now, the meta transaction is made in the way that the reward comes from the smart contract, but that would be a great. Uh, topic for discussion to add to the meta transactions uh, on GitHub or Ethereum Magicians, which is, can we actually make the reward come from someone else? 
Can we have the dApps or the wallet provides actually paying rewards to relayers so they don't have to handle it? That was pretty cool. Right, I'll, I'll write these down. So there's there's multiple parts to this this smart wallet. Uh, so the the smart contract which actually holds the funds in your behalf is the ERC seven two five as it exists right now. It doesn't have to be because technically this is just the boilerplate for a multi signature wallet with uh, delegate uh, private keys and everything. So it provides you with the flexibility of creating this access control of a multi sig. Then you. Have yeah, question. Does it actually implement multi sig or does it just implement key management? Implements key management. Yeah. But the multi sig is still something. There's no standard for multi sig. Or is there? Isn't it a key, key access control multisig in a way? I, you can define purpose, right? On the, you, you can add a key with a purpose, but yeah. you can't have an M of N signature scheme. Right? ERC-725 doesn't implement this M of N. Um, oh, you mean the, the signing, the standard for the signing. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right, yeah, you're correct. Sorry, my terrible writing. That's 1077. That's the executable signed messages, which is the terrible name for meta transaction. <laughs> is that basically just like off-chain transactions? No, it's meta transactions. So the, you're, you have a signed message which the relayer will submit on your behalf. It, it's not really off-chain, off chain, but it's almost like it's on hold. It's like bash transactions? Not necessarily. So. So it could be, though. To make it a little more concrete, though, if, if I were trying to use the system and we're trying to sign, let's say, a zero rights order, um, and, and um, that order wasn't necessarily ever going to settle, go on chain or anything, I was just going to put it up on relay. Um, what, what part of this actually signs that order? And then if someone were to like EC recover that signature, what, well, what, what address would recover to? <laughs> That's only part, and I haven't, I haven't done any 7.5. Okay, so I think we're in time for a diagram. <laughs> it's gonna take a bit more time because I'm actually describing as I'm diagramming. So as a user, you have a key, which is irrelevant that you can lose at any time because it's just one of X keys that you actually have access to the contract. Your contract is what you now have as an account. This is your identity account, uh, but think of identity as not necessarily your personal identity. This could be your username, could be cat1998 or something, it doesn't matter. So this is your identity proxy contract. You sign a message, and this message has the signature from this key. This contract knows that this key has permissions to move funds from this contract. The relayer, which I, I'm not sure how am I going to draw this, but I'm going to say it more. The relayer will be able to receive this message and submit it on the blockchain. When it submits on the blockchain, it's actually calling the smart contract which then is going to actually do the delegate call. So if you were going to interact with 0x smart contract, the smart contract from 0x is actually seeing a transaction coming from the, this contract. The transaction was actually submitted by the relayer, which, in, which triggered the smart contract for the identity contract. So you're always interacting with the whole blockchain as you are this contract signing with this key. You don't actually have to use this key. You don't have this key, it's a smart contract. So you sign with this key, which could be on your mobile, and then you have another one, which is on your phone. So you have like separate keys in multiple devices, but they all act as this account on the, on the interface of the dApp you're actually interacting with. Yes, that's why I said meta transactions is not off chain. 
it doesn't solve the scalability, it solves the the recovery and the user adoption, where you actually can have users actually paying gas with tokens, you can have users' gas being paid by other parties, and then again, you have users losing keys without any worries, or losing their funds, because there's recovery systems that can actually recover through other key systems. I'm just thinking about some usability problems here. Uh, so let's say there's a DAC that needs a signature of the user, so that's the IP uh, contract. How would the user go about to sign a message, which, which isn't necessarily a transaction? Can you walk me through the flow? When a, when a DAP just asks the user to sign a message, but the, the user is now a smart contract. Yeah, that's not really like, like a we love. Like a zero source, like signed off chain, probably. Yeah. So, how do we present zero source in this? Style. That's interesting. That's that's where the part of the smart contract actually has to adapt to it. I mean, so so you have so these keys. There's a, a list of keys in this contract. So if it, you need I mean, you need ERC seven twenty five support, but essentially what you would do is you would sign with one of these keys, and the um, and so the um, the. Zero X contract or the Zero X relayer actually would have to be aware that this key is of a is a key on an ERC seven twenty five identity. It would check the identity if that key is authorized or if it has been revoked. So if you would lose a key, you would need to revoke or like remove it. Um, and then, like as long as you're using a key that is um, active, and so you have like purposes. So. I think there's not really an established standard for this yet, but so that's the idea, I think, where it goes. Okay, so if you wanted to recover sort of the address of, of the signer, you need to have the contract itself signing, mm -hmm. but I don't think you can. So, no, what you would do, so you can't have the contract signed. You have, um, you sign with a key and you need to say, I'm using this key that is um, on this list of authorized key for this contract, right? And then you, you have to check, re read on the contract, uh, is this key authorized that I'm getting from the EC recovery? So the DAP would need to adapt to yes. the yeah. yeah, it is. It doesn't stop backwards compatible. The DAP has to be aware. Yeah. There's a major usability problem here, though, is that like a lot of DAPs to do sign on, uh, they just have you sign a message with some kind of knots on it, some like, you know, non replayable thing. You can wait for a long time to sign on to an app with this. You actually no, sign on and wait for it to get mine. That's exactly what you were saying. So basically, meta transactions are backwards compatible, but then signing on the behalf of the smart contract wouldn't be backwards compatible. And the zero x smart contract would actually have to support the RC seven two five and actually look up that this key is uh, has permissions to this contract to sign on that yeah, behalf. C two has a sender, so like you might be able to use that. For, uh, kind of chaining onto that. Is there a nonce internal to the smart contract? Like so that you can't yes. the reader can't resubmit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Because at the end, a smart contract is a normal account that has an application built on top. It, it has a, an address, it has a nonce, it has a balance. At the end, this key being on blockchain as an account and this smart contract being an account. And the thing the user is signing goes and looks at the nonce and pulls out and says. Yeah, so the meta transaction, that, that's one of the things with the subscriptions, actually having the ability to actually increase the nonce, because if you have a recurring meta transaction and the user is making transactions in between each payment, it has to look up the nonce and update it for the next uh, transaction. Any other questions? Any ideas for how smart wallets will play a role? In, or what kind of applications can we build that we couldn't it couldn't be possible to normal accounts. I don't have an answer to that. I just have another question. <laughs> is all of this like this, does it face the same considerations as like the broader economic abstraction debate, uh, like which is pretty polarizing, I guess. Like, is it the same concerns? Or that? So the the biggest concern you have here is you, we added a layer of abstraction, right? In order to provide key recovery, we needed to add this third-party relayer. Is this as censorship resistant as submitting your own transactions? Short answer, no. Can we create incentivization systems to actually make this close enough censorship resistant? 
Yes, but at the end of the day, if you want to be full mode self-sovereign, you will you will store your seed phrase. There's an incentive there if you want to be self-sovereign to store your seed phrase closely. But for the mainstream user who just wants to use a few dApps, this is actually a great onboarding experience that makes it pretty smooth. And you could even have you know, your wealth tied, tied up in your self-sovereign ID, but you know, for your everyday use, you'd have something like this, right? Yes. And you can actually have multiple accounts, one with higher value and less value, and, or you can still have your ledger with a lot of funds and use transfer to this smart contract to use it for a monthly budget or something. And as a relayer, I have the IP address and, and the smart contract for each person. Because I know so, the address there, who knows which is going to be addressed. Uh, yeah, the meta transaction will be tied to the smart contract, yes. So the meta transactions recipient will be the smart contract, yes. So that's the part of where there are some censorship resistant failure on the relayer part. So, okay, I just thought of something that, that maybe would actually work uh, to get rid of the block time for like things like just verifying a personal signed message, but to say that support, you know, that would have to support it. Does, does that, that contract that holds your identity, like the proxy uh, contract, does that have the list of, of uh, the, public, the public address for all the private keys that are authorized on it? Yes. So, so could you have it so like that someone could do a sign on, like where the, the app sends them a message to sign and then they can recover whatever um, the VR is off of it? Could, they, could that thing just go query that contract and say, oh, yes, this is in the, the set of keys that's okay to sign with right now, thus, thus really, like, not having to wait for my but, but, but that would be the, the part where it's not backwards compatible, right? That's the part where the DAP would... Uh, no, no, but th that's, that's what he was saying. So that's, that's exactly what he meant, but it would require the, the DAPs to adapt to the 725 for off-chain signing. So. Yeah, so it, yes. So the idiot user losing their key and account recovery problem. So, sorry? It solves the, the user losing their key and recovering the account for them. Yes, and it uh, allows a lot of experimentation, actually. There's a few different uh, patterns for key recovery. There's social recovery, where you actually assign guardians that you can actually call all of these guardians to unlock the account for a new private key because you've lost every single one of the keys that you had. There's time lock recovery, where if the uh, the recovery goes, uh, if the account goes inactive for a certain period that is established on the contract, you can send funds to the contract to actually unlock it after a certain period. There's uh, multiple recovery systems that we can actually play that was never possible with the public and private key cryptography. So it's a great user experience that will bring a lot of mainstream adoptions. Other questions, ideas of... One minute. One minute. So, last question. Last question. Is Wallet Connect building like a front end for this? Like, what is Wallet Connect? So, Wallet Connect is just super excited about Wallet. <laughs> uh, Wallet Connect is a is a protocol for communicating wallets. So, it, we help with the the security of the private key management, where you can actually have authorization between different wallets without having to expose private keys. In the sense where you can actually have a main key, as we said, there would be main, um, keys with higher permission than others, and this main key could then expose a QR code for Wallet Connect to establish a connection to the next key and actually sign to approve this key. So you have the verification between keys. Right now, the, uh, Wallet Connect is only prepared to accept um, normal accounts where you actually have one key signing as one account, but it would be very possible when we actually implement the Wallet to Wallet uh, protocol. Thanks, everyone.